From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a safety prerogative, this is the source of information on psychological injury prevention and health promotion. Welcome to Safety Labs by Slice. Folks, sometimes we talk about a very specific topic on the show, and other times we have a wider ranging conversation with our guest. Today's show is the latter. I'll be speaking with Joelle Mitchell, an organizational psychologist and human factors specialist. Joelle takes academic research findings from the fields of psychology, OHS, and human factors and translates them into the language and tools used in the field of risk management. Joelle has a master's degree in applied psychology and is a regular speaker at industry events. She's currently the Global Head of Psychological Health and Safety at Flourish DX. As a practitioner, she applies the principles of evidence-based practice to drive improvement in psychological health and safety outcomes. Joelle joins us from Perth. Welcome. Thank you, Mary. So your safety background is in risk management, but in the past few years, you've shifted your focus to psychosocial health or to that space a little bit more. Can you tell me about that shift and how and why your interests have evolved in that direction? Yeah, so um, I suppose I ended up in safety a little bit just by luck rather than design um, in that I was working for a um, an EPCM um, and just sort of out of, um, out of my undergraduate degree just needed a job. So I was working in document control and kind of moved my way through the organization until I landed in in the safety team um, and then decided to do um, my master's in organizational psychology at at that time um, and have sort of stayed in in safety from there and so that was um, supporting um, an oil and gas producer here in Australia so I've kind of yeah stayed stayed in that sort of safety psychology type of function throughout my career uh, before I joined Flourish DX, I was I had been with Offshore Petroleum Regulator in Australia, uh, not SEMA. Um, I'd been with them for nine years. Um, so started out in that role, sort of looking at um, things like safety culture in the offshore petroleum industry in Australia, um, looking at how to improve understanding and application of human factors concepts, um, both in the offshore operators as well as within not seem or within the ex- inspectorate so helping to sort of upskill the inspectors in understanding human factors concepts how that applies within the inspection framework that not was was using um, that sort of thing and in that role really got exposed to or had had the opportunity to see the way that lots of different organizations approach dynamic risk management and sort of major accident event prevention so talking about the you know, sort of your, your multiple fatality type um, potential events um, and, you know, a lot of complexity, a lot of change um, and, yeah, looking at things from a, a safety case perspective where things are generally very well structured from a risk planning and prevention perspective and then how that translates into operations isn't always smooth or as predicted. Uh, and so, you know, sort of um, seeing how people in operations would work within or outside of the, the boundaries of, of that safety case and then sort of what, what the consequences of that were. During the pandemic, we started to see um, more complaints coming through around mental health concerns for the offshore workforce. So being in Western Australia, we had a, um, a, a relatively unique response to the pandemic. So our um, the way that Australia works is we do have a Commonwealth government, but then each state or territory also has its own sort of local government um, and the Premier is, is the head of that government. So the state Premier in WA closed our borders. Uh, so yeah, nobody, nobody was allowed in or out um, unless you had a justified reason for coming in or out. And so if you did come through the border from somewhere else, you basically had to do a two-week quarantine period before you could be then released in into the state. And so the offshore petroleum industry in Australia relies very heavily on a workforce that flies in and out of various places, both interstate and internationally. So generally what, what people will do is they'll fly in and do a two-week swing offshore and then they'll go home for two weeks. That's That's sort of the normal roster pattern and there's some variation to that. 
And so what ended up happening was that people would be sort of coming into WA, they'd have to do a two-week quarantine and then they'd be going to do their stint offshore. And so everything kind of got thrown out of whack. There were people who were essentially just staying in Western Australia for a long period of time. Um, so there were people who kind of hadn't been home to see their families for six months or, or that sort of thing. And then the offshore facilities themselves were also introducing quarantine periods because they didn't want to have an outbreak of, of COVID in the offshore facility because that, you know, they all live really on top of each other and this was pre-vaccines and, and all of that sort of thing. So um, an outbreak offshore could have been, you know, potentially catastrophic for them. So what we had were, you know, large groups of, of the workforce who were essentially displaced from their family, you know, really going... I guess, out of their way to essentially enable their employers to continue producing and varying degrees of or approaches to managing that from from different employers, um, different operators. So, yeah, so, some operators really were a lot more mindful of the mental health impacts on the workforce, issues of isolation and that sort of thing. And as, you know, as time progressed, they developed more sophisticated ways of managing that quarantine period so that people weren't necessarily isolated. They would sort of quarantine together in a group, that sort of thing. But yeah, I guess during that period of time, we did have a lot more concerns relating to the mental health of the offshore workforce. And so being the only psychologist at Nopsema, I was uh, really brought in to, um, to look at those things um, in a lot more detail, I guess. And in parallel with that, um, we've also had a progression to a point of having regulations about psychological health and safety or psychosocial risk management introduced in Australia. Uh, so that sort of started back in 2018 um, when Marie Boland conducted a review of our work health and safety legislation and, and recommended that we needed more explicit um, regulation relating to psychosocial hazard management. And so that had been sort of developing along as well. Um, and those regulations are currently in force in the majority of states and territories in Australia now. So how did I end up at Flourish DX? Uh, Jason contacted me and asked me if I was interested. <laughs> okay, so last time we spoke before, we talked about a whole bunch of different topics. And one of your interests is in looking at the relationship between organizational structures and safety outcomes. So in other words, what you'd said is that you believe that the way hierarchies and reporting lines are established has a direct effect on safety outcomes. What's the connection? So essentially, the majority of us want secure work. And so the way that we behave, the actions that we take in our employment are going to be grounded in that, in, in that desire to maintain secure work. So... The way that organizations are structured, and if we talk about things like reward and recognition structures as well as reporting lines, they can have a really big impact on on safety outcomes, um, I guess, depending on the reporting line through from from somebody in operations, you know, so if we I guess if we take like the role of a, a safety advisor in an operations, so in a in a location at a site, if they're reporting through, the, the production manager or the asset manager or the, the site manager for that site and that reports through the operations line, the, the goal of that operations manager is going to be primarily related to production targets. Now, we can argue that, yes, they, they have responsibilities for safety through the legislation and through, you know, their position description and those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, ultimately, an organisation is only going to be successful if it continues to sell what it's selling. And to be able to sell what it's, what it's selling, it needs to be able to produce what it's selling. And so fundamentally, that, that's sort of the core purpose of that organization is that it, it needs to be profitable. It needs to be able to produce whatever it is that it produces. And so if you're an asset manager, you have a number of competing priorities and objectives, but you, ultimately your primary objective is production. And hopefully it, you know, it's framed in a safe production context. Now, as a safety advisor in that location, if your reporting line is through that asset manager, then the asset manager needs to sort of balance what they're hearing from their safety advisors, as well as what they're hearing from everybody else on the site, 
as well as things like their KPIs, as well as looking at, well, you know, what's my bonus going to be? What's the bonus for my team and the people who are working on my site going to be? Um, are we going to continue operating this site if productivity is um, not what it used to be? So there are a lot of competing demands at that asset manager level. And safety is just one of the things that they're thinking about when they're thinking about, well, how do we proceed um, sort of on a day-to-day basis in terms of managing um, operations on this site. And we're also really dependent on how well that asset manager understands safety, um, understands what, what the issues might be, how well the safety advisor is able to communicate those those issues and challenges and risks. You know, and there's a lot of variability on on both sides there um, in terms of receptiveness and, and understanding of concepts, as well as that ability to communicate and influence upwards. Um, a lot of the time, you know, we bring safety advisors into a site because we want them to manage safety downwards. Um, and so we're, we're bringing them in for those skills of sort of people management rather than, um, yeah, sort of upwards influence. And a lot of the time, they're actually not encouraged to do the upwards influencing. So if we have that same safety advisor or group of advisors in that same operations, but they're reporting through a safety line instead, where we've got an independent safety function in that organization that sits at the same level to the operations function in terms of seniority, in terms of reporting into um, the, the executive then what we have is a stronger voice arguing for safety protections without having those same, I don't want to say conflicting, but I guess those those same um, challenges or trade-offs that that operations manager would is sort of grappling with. And so whether it's, whether it's done deliberately or not, um, a lot of the time if we do have the reporting line for site safety through the operations management of that site, the the safety messaging can really be significantly diluted. And that means then from a due diligence perspective, from the executive and board perspective, they actually don't have a good line of sight to risk management in operations. And so having, yeah, really that organisational structure has such a big part to play in how well senior leadership understands what are the hazards, what are our critical risks and how well are they currently being managed and how exposed are we as a business? Um, If that's coming through an independent safety line, then they're going to be more well-informed than they are um, if it's coming through an operational line. And, you know, recognising that some, you know, everybody, every operational leader is different and and some of them will do a very good job at communicating that and and balancing that and others not so much. So, yeah, recognising that there is a lot of variability in there. And I guess, yeah, speaking in gross over (laughs) generalizations. Well, as we have to, I mean, we can't go through everything, but I'm, I'm also curious because we talked last time about the responsibilities of psychosocial health and safety and how they related. uh, So we did talk about operations, also HR um, as another potential organizational, um, I shouldn't say silo, but department that is um, often involved. What are your views on kind of where in the mix does that work? Is that is that a good idea? So, is it, should it be separate? What do you think? I think H- HR is almost in a similar position a lot of the time to the safety function um, in that, again, depending on how the organization is structured, how... Um, how those reporting lines into the executive are structured and also the sort of competencies that an organization actually looks for when they're recruiting into those functions as well. You can have HR and safety functions that do really feed into um, the strategy of the organization and are able to do a really good job of informing um, and being collaborative and sort of building or working, working together to achieve different outcomes and recognising that there's a really significant overlap uh, between safety and, and industrial relations matters. And the I think, yeah, the siloing isn't helpful to it, to addressing those overlaps. So, you know, if we're thoughtful in, in the competencies that we're recruiting for in those roles, they can actually be really powerful and really effective roles. Um, I think just a, a lot of the time 
that isn't the level of competence or, or those types of competencies aren't what organizations are looking for when they're when they're filling those roles. And so what we can end up with is, you know, a, a HR team that's potentially, you know, been sourced through their, their recruitment specialists, for example. Uh, they might be very good at being recruitment specialists and then they get promoted into a HR management role and they really don't have a good grasp of the broader HR function. But I think there doesn't seem to be a consistent understanding of actually what are the what are the competencies that we need for somebody to actually be effective from a, a strategic perspective when it comes to being a, a HR manager or, or a senior HR person in an organisation. When we're talking about psychosocial risk management, I think a lot of this has traditionally sat in HR's remit because it's been framed as employee well-being, uh, and that's you know a lot of that is then framed around employee benefits, which is part of your sort of recruitment and retention strategies. And that comes from, I guess, historically, our view of mental health is that it's something that sits inside people's minds. And we haven't really taken that social determinants of health perspective when we, when we thought about mental health or when we framed mental health. Sorry, meaning that social determinants, meaning that the organization and the 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 culture, the context that it creates, as opposed to mental health being in a very individualistic thing. Is that is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. So if we, I mean, even if we looked broader than organizations, right, we know that mental health outcomes are linked to things like housing security and food security, job security, um, you know, all of those so- sort of really high level factors. Um, and a lot of that's driven by things like government policy. Um, and then so within an organization, then we can sort of take that down a level and say, well, you know, what is it within an organization, thinking about it from that social determinants of health perspective, what is it within an organization that can influence mental health outcomes, either in a positive or a negative direction for the workforce? And so again, you know, there's the big ticket items like job security, getting a livable wage. I was going to say fair compensation. Yeah, ab- like absolutely. And then, you know, the basics, a workplace yeah. where you're not going to be bullied, where you're not going to be sexually harassed, where you're not going to be assaulted or verbally abused, th- those those kinds of things. And there are other things that sometimes are actually sort of baked into your role, like exposure to trauma. Um, you know, if you're a first responder, if you're a counsellor, um, you know, there's there's lots and lots of roles where engagement with psychosocial hazards are actually the primary function of that role. So there's, there's quite a lot of, um, of nuance involved when we're, when we're talking about psychosocial hazard management. So I guess what we've seen in Australia is um, a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction where because it's now explicitly outlined in the work health and safety regulations – some organizations are going, oh, okay, well, now it's just safety's responsibility. Yeah, I was I was going to ask about that. And actually in ISO uh, 45003, in the guidelines, I, I looked this up for, for managing psychosocial health in the workplace. It specifically states that the, the guidance, quote, discusses managing psychosocial risk within an occupational health and safety management system. So it's explicit, right? Right in the... Uh, right in the wording there. Yeah. So again, just because it's part of your OHS management system doesn't mean that all of the responsibility for it sits in your OHS function, right? So I think that the, the key there is your OHS function owns your risk management cycle, right? So they own the processes around how do we identify hazards? How do we assess risks? How do we introduce controls? How do we monitor the effectiveness of those controls? What are the triggers that tell us that we need to revisit our risk assessment like that you know, th- those are processes that are owned by the OHS function, but we need to separate that out from who are the control owners. So if we think about that again from a, a physical health and safety perspective, you know, if we had OHS inspectors that said, okay, well, yeah, we need to do this structural inspection, they're not necessarily the ones who are going to go and do that inspection. They're going to bring in, you know, specialists who are competent in, in doing that. Um, and then any issues that are identified that need to be rectified through that inspection, again, the safety team isn't going to be the ones who are actually going to fix, you know, the crack in the foundations of the bridge. That's going to go to the structural engineering team and they're going to actually come up with the solution for that that issue. And so it's the same thing when we're talking about psychosocial hazard management is, yes, your OHS team is going to say, right, well, this is when we need to do a risk assessment. And okay, we've seen that that trigger has happened and we need to do that now. And here are the 
the tools that we have available for you to do that um, or for the organization to do that, what do we find? And then whatever we find, those controls need to go to the appropriate control owner in the organization. And a lot of the time, the control owners are actually going to be HR because we, you know, we think about the touch points that we have with an organization as an employee, the majority of those are actually owned by the HR function. And that includes our leaders because, you know, a leader selection process is driven by HR, you know, identification of competencies for roles that's managed by HR recruitment and selection processes, you know, all of those things actually have, are, are fundamentally owned by HR. So yeah, the, the, there's a separation between the process ownership and the control ownership. And, and we need to really be clear on that and also recognize where we need HR and OHS to work together in that space. So that makes perfect sense to me. Do you often see that in organizations though? Like it to me, as you describe it, I'm like, oh yeah, of course. That's that's the way it maybe not always should be done, but that it, it's a very sensible way to do it. But it also doesn't sound like anything I've ever heard is all that common. <laughs> do you like current state, do you see that in organizations? Or is it more something you'd like to see more of? Yeah. So I think it's it's an important caveat here is that the vast majority of organizations, if not all organizations, are very early on um, in their psychosocial risk management processes. And so, you know, I think what, what I'm really talking about is this is where we want to get to, recognizing where we are now and, you know, helping helping organizations to see what that future state could look like. And use, using those analogies back to, well, how do you manage it from a physical health and safety perspective? does really help where organizations have mature safety management systems. So I have seen some organizations who are sort of proactively saying, yeah, we're, we're actually managing a handover of ownership of these concepts from HR over to um, our health and safety function. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's starting, um, but recognizing, yeah, where we are now, where we're going to be in five years time. Um, I think there's, you know, it, it, I'm excited to see where we where we are in five years' time in terms of the progress that we're able to make in this space. Uh, something else that you mentioned when you and I first spoke is that reward, and this this in some ways goes with talking about HR as well, reward and recognition structures are a primary driver of organizational behavior, right? We We act in the way that we know we'll be rewarded. But Sometimes incentive programs are actually at odds with um, either operational requirements, safety requirements. Um, can you expand a little bit on the challenges that that this sort of dissonance, like this cognitive dissonance, happens? Like what you what is incentivized is not necessarily what is asked for. If that makes any sense. Yeah. So generally, when incentives are built or introduced to drive particular behaviours, the, the question always comes, well, how do we measure whether or not those behaviours are happening? And, you know, you're not going to have somebody out there dedicated observing, you know, sort of that making a tick every time they see somebody do that particular behaviour. And so what we require is something that's a proxy measurement. And so, again, you know, traditionally we can look at things like the um, the Take 5 process on on a site where people need to do their sort of you know spend five minutes reassess the 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 job site for hazards um see if anything's changed since they went on break or or whatever it might be that sort of thing and so okay well we want people to do these so we're going to give everybody a daily kpi that they need to do two or three or however many a day and so the the goal there is we want people to be checking their work site for any changes since they since they went on break or, or since it you know since they finished their last shift and this is the mechanism that we're giving them to do that so that we can monitor whether or not that's happening and typically what we end up with is that people will just pre-write them in the morning in the crib room before they go for the day and they sort of they'll write their three and they'll they'll pop them in the box and that's it they've, they've met their kpi so what we're rewarding is just paperwork that's not actually achieving the outcome that we want to see. There's lots of examples of this sort of thing. Hi listeners, Jason here. We hope you're enjoying this latest podcast episode. 
Now, if you're like Joelle, Alicia and myself and enjoy learning from the best, then the Flourish DX Academy is for you. The Academy includes free e-learning courses on the ISO 45003 standard for psychological health and safety at work and associated topics such as how to conduct a psychosocial risk assessment and how to create the business case for psych health and safety. All courses feature high quality videos, downloadable resources, multi-choice questions and a downloadable training certificate on completion. Take your learning to the next level with all Flourish DX Academy courses included within the Flourish DX mobile app. Select podcast episodes from the Psych Health and Safety podcast and sister podcasts from Canada and the USA are also included. Get started with Flourish DX for free at www.flourishdx.com forward slash get hyphen started. That's www.flourishdx.com forward slash get hyphen started. Now back to this episode. And I think it's important that people aren't doing that because they're trying to be um, they're trying to be difficult. They're doing it because there is a disconnection between like at the same time as saying, fill out this paperwork, do these checks. They're also being told, but do your job faster, you know, produce quickly. Right. Like, is that is that where the the fundamental clash happens or. That that can be a reason for it. I think another reason for it can be that they just don't see it as a as a value adding process for them. Like I can look around my work site and I can see whether things have changed. I can do that in my brain. Me making a record of that um, is essentially for the organisation to protect itself and say that it's taken all reasonably practical steps. Uh, but putting that responsibility on me as the worker. Um, to say that I've done these things that it's that it's asked me to do, so it's it's yeah. I th- I think that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of different factors that would feed into that um, into how why why somebody would would do that. But I think um, yeah, it's it's around efficiency. You know, you're doing that same job day in day out. You know what things are likely to change. You know what the hazards are and aren't. So yeah, there's 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 lots of examples of that and a really good paper that outlines. Well, that, that describes this really well is um, a paper that was written by Kerr um, called On the Folly of Rewarding A While Hoping for B. Um, so, yeah, that's um, I often refer people to that one. It is a classic, um, but it's a classic for a good reason. So I want to talk a little bit about controls. You've said that working in a complex safety management system, one of the risk management challenges is to understand the vitality of your controls. So are they vigorous? Are they degraded? Can you explain that challenge a little bit more? Yeah. Um, I think this sort of links in with things like the hierarchy of control, right? Where we talk about, um, you know, an elimination or an engineering substitution control is is more more effective, uh, more reliable than something like an administration control. Part of that is, is to do with, um, you know, if we've actually built something like a guard, we can see that it's there, we can see that it's in place, we can sort of test that it's working um, those sorts of things. And so when we're talking about, I guess, individual hazard management, um, it can be fairly easy to see whether those higher level sort of physical control measures are actually in place or not. We can see if somebody's wearing a harness, we can see if there's scaffolding and barricading up where it needs to be, um, those types of things. When we're looking more broadly and we're looking at safety management systems that may have controls that were implemented 10, 15, 20 years ago in the design phase of a plant that is now, you know, has gone through construction and has been operating for 10 years. Um, And we've got, you know, a decision that was made in in the design phase around um, the thickness of the the stainless steel that needed to be used to, to fabricate a pipe, for example, to, you know, with withstand a certain level of pressure or, or whatever that might be. So there's those decisions sort of in that early engineering and design phase. And then there's what happened during procurement, you know, were decisions made at procurement to to change the those initial design criteria and, and how well were those decisions evaluated from a from a safety perspective? Were they really were, were those decisions more around timeline management and, you know, did we have a um, a milestone that we needed to meet again so that we could get our bonus for this stage of the project or, or whatever that might be or, you know, 
because we've got agreements in place with with the client and with suppliers, et cetera. Um, so if we're going to delay this particular milestone, what are the ramifications of that, um, you know, for, for the rest of the project versus, you know, it, it seems like a small change. Is that change actually captured in the information that we have about the design? And is that change then introduced into our management plans in terms of, you know, how often do we need to inspect and what chemical treatment do we need to use or all those types of things. So what might seem like a really small and insignificant change at one point in this really, really complex project can actually have significant ramifications that may not come to light for 20 years. And so, you know, I've got my bonus and what happens in 20 years time is going to have absolutely no impact on me whatsoever. Do I even have a good enough understanding of the broad implications of the decision that I'm making in the, at this point in time? Um, or, you know, am I somebody with a finance background who really doesn't understand safe design and doesn't understand chemical engineering or, or whatever it might be? Um, so do I actually really understand the implications of the decision that I'm making? Um, as an organization, do we have sufficient systems of work in place? And this is where we're talking about, you know, are they administrative controls? Are they what, what are they when we're talking about systems of work? Because we're largely telling people what they need to do, uh, but we're telling people what they need to do to implement controls that would be considered elimination or engineering or substitution or whatever they might be. So this is, this is really where that complexity comes into it, that, that we, as we have so many, many, many layers of safety controls, you know, spanning decades, we end up with a really opaque management system in that somebody who's actually working on the tools or even a site manager um, or an asset manager or whatever it might be, they don't have visibility of all of those controls going back for however long and whether or not they were degraded or not. And if they were degraded, were those, those degradations actually accommodated for moving forward? So you might be making a decision again at that point in time and you're making a trade-off decision between, well, we have this operational target. This is sort of what our safety rule says. We think that we can manage around that if we do it this way instead, and we can do that and still maintain safety for the team who are working here, for example. But that trade-off might actually interact with a number of other trade-offs or changes or degradations of those historic control measures that you're not aware of, and that interaction might actually lead to something going bang. Or even like some... They have the, like you said, if they don't understand the uh, implications of the trade off, then they think, oh, wow, look at that. We saved this much money or we delivered that much faster. Why weren't we doing this before? Yep. Let's do it from now on. <laughs> you can see how this can happen. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, when it, when a trade off works um, and you don't actually, yeah, things, things didn't go bang. Um, if we don't explore that well and actually say, well, was there a potential for something to go wrong here? Then, yeah, what we typically will end up with is um, that trade-off will be repeated because it worked and it'll be repeated and repeated until it becomes essentially the new in unofficial standard for safe work um, in relation to this particular thing that we're doing. And so that's also then sort of how, um, how control measures can be degraded over time at the local level as well. And so Jens Rasmussen did a really good paper on this. Um, again, it's quite an old one, but it just outlines it so well. And that's called Risk Management in a Dynamic Society. So that's, um, it is open access if you can find the right hyperlink. So that, yeah, that, um, that, that paper outlines this issue really quite nicely. So then at, as a safety manager, perhaps a new safety professional has come, you know, newly hired new in the organization, but the organization goes back 20 years or longer. How how do you get, like you don't know what's degraded. You can't see it in in this type of example. How do you attack that challenge? How do you, how do you maybe not attack it, but how do you, uh, how do you deal with that and see if you can find the hidden, the hidden trade-offs that led the controls down, down a merry path? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I think maybe unfortunately the answer is that you, th there are some things that are just going to be hidden if they weren't captured. They they just won't be there until you, if you happen to stumble across them. I think you know at a, at a site level it is around understanding where are people being 
or wh- where are people making trade-off decisions um, and monitoring those and understanding why. Why are those trade-off decisions being made and actually being mindful of, okay, well, let's actually explore this. Is this an innovation that we can actually introduce and, and incorporate as part of our safe work practices? Or are there risks that the work group weren't aware of that, you know, we were lucky this time that things didn't go wrong, but maybe that that's something that we need to address. Um, so I don't think that it's about cracking down and saying procedure, 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 and nobody deviates because we know that that's just not not actually possible or practicable in that, you know, in a dynamic work situation. So it's more about saying, well, yeah, trade-offs are going to happen. Um, so we need mechanisms in place so that we can understand what those trade-offs are when they're happening um, and we can actually evaluate those to uh, to determine whether or not they're okay to, to continue or not and whether we can um, sort of build those into the way that we do things or not. Okay, so let's, I, I want to move back a little bit into governance for psychosocial health and safety. So I'm guessing that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to how psychosocial health and safety should be managed in terms of organizational structure. But what kind of factors do you suggest people look at to decide which, to just dis- make decisions about governance for psychosocial health and safety? Like what should be considered? Yeah. So look, I think wherever possible, if you can use your existing health and safety governance structures and expand those to encompass psychosocial health and safety as well, um, I think that that's that, that's, I think, probably the best approach to use for now. Um, and so I've sort of talked before about, you know, where we're going to be in five years. We don't know. Uh, so I think that, you know, for now, the approach that I lean towards is wherever possible using existing safety management frameworks, structures, models, because we really want to ensure that organisations are anchoring employee mental health within a safety framework instead of within an employee benefits, get them to support framework. So we want to move them out of that individual health management, you know, sort of accommodations perspective into a let's design the work so that it's safe and protects people perspective. So I've used this analogy a few times, but like, you know, when automobiles were first introduced and they were sharing the road with horses, they actually would mount a fake horse head on the front of the automobiles so that it would be less startling for people and for horses who were sharing the roads because, you know, there's this thing that's just moving around of its own accord. And making Um, noise. Yes. (laughs) Stick a horse head on the front of it and it sort of starts to look a little bit like something that we're already familiar and comfortable with. And so I think that where we're at at the moment in terms of psychosocial risk management is we're a little bit like sticking the horse's head on the front of the automobile. We know that it's sort of serving the same purpose as physical health and safety risk management. And so we want it to look the same at the moment so that people within organizations are able to actually ground it and anchor it in those safety management principles and think about it from those perspectives. Once we're there, hopefully um, our practices, processes and approaches will evolve and mature. And so, you know, yeah, where we are in five years time, hopefully we don't need the safety the physical health and safety horse head on the front of it, and we can just have it as it is. But where we are now, I think we we really need to frame it in ways that are familiar to organisations instead of it being this big, new, scary thing um, so that organisations can actually be more comfortable in adopting these practices um, in a way that feels familiar to them um, so that it's not as scary for them. It doesn't seem like such an insurmountable challenge. Summary, we're at the horse head stage. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, no, and, and that's good too, because, you know, longtime health and safety practitioners, it's new to them too, right? And to some degree. And so Absolutely. you're you're taking something that's new to you, having to implement it and understand it and then introduce it w- more widely to the organization. It's, it's a big ask, as they say. I have a question about psychosocial health and safety that... Last time we spoke, you mentioned a term that was new to me. I have heard it mentioned since, but I haven't dug into it. So I'm curious, what is moral injury in this? um, What does it mean in this context? Yeah, so moral injury, it's really tied in quite tightly with concepts of organizational justice. And I guess people's sense of whether they've been treated fairly by their employer um, and it's probably tied in fairly closely with things like psychological contract as well. 
you know, we come to work and have expectations about what our employer will provide for us in exchange for our time, effort, physical or mental effort, um, you know, all of those things. Whether those things, whether those expectations are explicit within our employment contract or sort of implicit assumptions about what should be there in, in terms of that relationship. When our employer behaves in a way that violates those those assumptions or those agreements, depending on, on how significant that is, obviously, um, that can over time lead to what we call a moral injury, which is essentially your employer has betrayed you. And so you get this this sense of just that this work that I'm doing or this situation that I'm engaged in is fundamentally unfair and, and particularly where that has caused either psychological or physical damage to an individual. Yeah, it, it can lead then to psychological harm. Um, and I think we see that a lot uh, where people are going through the workers' compensation system for a physical injury and the way that they're treated in that workers' compensation process actually leads them then to psychological injury because of you know, the, the number of barriers that are, that are put up, the difficulty in dealing with insurers and the approach that insurers take to that, which is that they want to reduce their own liability as much as possible. Uh, you know, but from a, a worker's perspective, well, I was doing my job. I was injured while I was doing my job. So, you know, I was there doing this thing for my employer and now I'm injured and now my employer is doing whatever they can to get out of caring for me despite it being essentially their fault, largely, that I've now got this injury. And so, you know, from, from a psychological perspective, that really is harmful. Um, and it, you know, it manifests in lots of different ways. I think um, in, in the pandemic, we saw it a lot with healthcare workers, for example, where um, doctors and nurses were needing to make decisions about who could be given a respirator because they didn't have enough. And that's just almost diametrically opposed to the role of doctors and nurses in, in a hospital environment or in, in, in any type of um, life-saving type of an environment where they're actually having to go, well, who's more likely to live in this situation and actually making those decisions and largely saying, okay, I'm deciding that these people are going to have to die because my employer hasn't given me the resources that I need to be able to do the job that I'm here to do. Yeah, because initially they are, they didn't have those guidelines. So, so you talked about where you'd like to see the health and safety profession as a whole in five years in terms of all the things that we've talked about. Is there anything else or anything that you're excited to see in the next five to 10 years, maybe just with the profession as a whole, like as it, as it moves forward? Yeah, look, I, I would really like to see, I'd like to see less tribalism in, in the health and safety community, if we want to use that word. I'm not sure how we get there. Yeah, I, I don't know if we need more well-defined competence frameworks um, when we're talking about who, you know, people that are working in that safety function. And it's, it's almost sort of the same picture as it is for HR as well. Um, I think where I would love to see both of those functions or people in those functions develop is in in things like science literacy so that they are actually able to take evidence-informed approaches um, and not just have to take somebody else's word for it that this approach is evidence-informed or evidence-based. And I think the, the other really key competence for, for both of those functions is, to, to go back to what I was talking about before, the ability to influence upwards within the organisation and, you know, to understand what is a strategy, you know, a big S strategy in an organisation and how do I contribute to that or, or develop one. Th those, those are really, I think, two big pieces of, of the puzzle that are largely missing when we're looking at, you know, the range of competencies that we want in those two functions. So I would really love to see more people being recruited into safety and HR functions who have that um, grounding in um, good science, whether that's physical science or social science. And then, yeah, on the other side of it, yeah, being educated in how to speak to an executive or or a board and and be able to put forward a convincing argument about what needs to change, why it needs to change, what's going to be involved in that. And conversely, I would think in the wider 
community having the expectation that is so that it wouldn't be such an odd thing for uh, an OHS manager to be um, managing up, as you say, but having the expectation that this is what we want from our OHS manager. So it's not it's not just what uh, people in the profession can provide, but it's also becomes the expectation of their role. Absolutely. Is that, yeah. Yeah. So that leads nicely into my next question. I have a few questions I ask every guest at the end. And one of them is, and it may be the same answer, but it may be different. If you were to choose a narrow set of interpersonal or human skills in an OHS training program, where would you focus that education? Which kind of um, interpersonal skills do you think would be most likely to equip tomorrow's safety professionals for what's to come in the world of safety? So I think this idea of humble inquiry that was um, maybe coined by um, Ed Shine probably a few decades ago now, um, I think that that's a, a really core soft skill or interpersonal skill um, that a lot of safety practitioners would benefit from understanding more and, and practicing more. Um, and again, you know, recognizing that there are plenty of, of practitioners out there who do this very well. Uh, but I think that it really is a core part of, again, to go back to, you know, actually understanding that concept of work as done, you need to be able to actually talk to people and understand what are they doing? Why are they doing it? Why does it make sense to them to do it that way? Or all of that sort of thing. And you can only do that through that process of humble inquiry. If you're going in saying, no, these are the rules and you're not following them and it's a breach or a deviation or whatever it might be, um, essentially you're going to be just confronted with a whole lot of fear and resistance and hiding of, of what's actually going on. So, you know, to be effective in your role, it's, yeah, I think less about enforcing the rules and more about seeking to understand why things are, are being done the way that they are. Okay, and if you could go back in time to the beginning of your safety career, what is one piece of advice that you might give to yourself? Um, oh, it's okay to not know the answer to something. It's okay to ask questions. Nobody expects you to know everything all at once. And yeah, just be be confident asking questions of people because most of the time um, people like to tell you about things that they know. Mm -hmm. And frequently there's someone else in the room, at least one other person who has the same question and was too scared to ask. Quite likely, yes. How can our listeners learn more about some of the topics in our discussion today? So you did mention a few papers. We'll see if we can find and link to those. But are there any um, books or websites that uh, you would direct people towards? Yeah, so I've mentioned the Kerr paper and the Rasmussen paper. Um, Hopkins wrote a book a little while ago called How Safety Creates Culture. Oh, sorry, How Structure Creates Culture. Um, so that really um, puts together a, a good description, I guess, of some of those structural things that I was talking about and how the reward and recognition and reporting lines kind of feed together to drive organisational behaviour. Um, so that's, um, and Hopkins is a sociologist, so I guess it's, it's written from a case study or from, from multiple case study perspectives. So that um, that that's quite a good one if people are interested in that. We at Flourish DX, we do run webinars almost on a weekly basis, uh, sort of talking about different aspects of um, psychosocial risk management, psychosocial health and safety. We've also got a professional practice program coming up, um, which is targeting safety and people leaders or, or, or functions um, focused on upskilling around um, psychosocial risk management in, in particular. Um, so people can go to flourishdx.com um, to find information about that. They can sign up to our uh, community and sort of get our regular updates on on whatever it is that we're doing. They can also follow us on LinkedIn. Um, we have our podcast, the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. Um, so we have a different guest, similar, similar to yourself, we have a different guest every episode to sort of talk about um, a different area of psychological health and safety, um, and they range from um, academics to practitioners, um, people in government, um, regulators, all sorts of... Uh, so we have a, a really good variety of guests on talking about lots of different topics. Um, so that that can be a really um, useful resource as well if people want to learn more about the topic. Um, and yeah, we're um, Jason and I are on LinkedIn quite a bit, so um, they're certainly welcome to connect with us as well. I was going to ask where listeners can find you on the web. So is LinkedIn the 
kind of the best if they wanted to reach out? Yeah, if they wanted to reach out to me personally, LinkedIn would be the best way to go. Yeah. Well, that is a wrap on today's show. Thanks so much for the interesting conversation, Joelle. Um, My pleasure. Listeners, did you know that, like your 13-year-old, Safety Labs is on TikTok? You won't see us doing meme-worthy dances, but you will see daily clips that make you go, hmm. So to find us, get on TikTok and search for Safety Labs. I'd like to thank the Safety Labs by Slice team for their dedication to the safety profession and to safety professionals. Bye for now. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on psychological injury prevention, follow Flourish DX on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast at www.psychhealthandsafety.com.